Good morning, guys. This is the YouTube video lecture for Chapter 10.4, Roots, Stems, and Leaves. This is for my 7th grade students. This is not for 8th grade. If you're an 8th grade student, um, close the video. We are done with our lecture videos. We only had Chapters 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3 if you're in 8th grade. Now, if you're in 7th grade, um, we're in Chapter 10, and we have Chapter 10 section four and we also have section five which i'll upload tomorrow so here's going to be the essential question what are the main functions of roots stems and leaves let's get started all right so here are the main parts of the roots uh, the roots have evolved to do um two things number one obviously to get um water and nutrients from the soil but the other thing that they've adapted to is to be able to grab onto the dirt and give it support. Now, uh, the roots are actually made up of, uh, there's a part of the root that's made up of dead cells. Uh, see this right here? The, this is called the root cap. This part of the cell is actually dead cells. And you can think of it this way. Um, if you ever work, uh, you know, with your hands a lot, if you're maybe like you're doing yard work and if you're notice, um, or also I've seen this in gymnasts and cheerleaders, um, you get calluses on your hand and that's like, you know, like the thick uh, skin on the hand and the more you work with your hands, the more calluses you have. Um, those calluses on your hand is um, actually dead cells. It forms like a protective layer. Now, because the root is digging itself deep into the ground, and it could cause damage. And remember, this is a living organism. That means that if it could get cut and infections could go in, bacteria and viruses could go in and uh, they could get infection. Yeah, and yes, trees can get infections. In fact, there are actual tree doctors that could go and um, and treat the uh, like uh, plants or usually trees that are infected with medicine. Otherwise, they die and now you have a dead tree. So because the root is digging into the ground and there's going to be a lot of friction, you have this protective layer of dead cells. That's called the root cap. Now, the, your book has a diagram like this. This is not the root cap, not this part. They're trying to show you that this where I'm pointing with my pen, this part right here, it's kind of like the light yellow part. So the root cap is very thick and it kind of extends to the sides. Okay. Now, but when the, the tree grows or the plant grows and the root gets longer, this part actually doesn't grow. You have this, it's simply called the area of dividing cells. This is where the root continues to grow. If you were to cut this tip of the root, the root would stop growing until it made more um, dividing cells. So what happens is this part doesn't grow or get longer. It just stays the same. And this part, these cells grow and divide and they kind of push the root cap down. Now, because the root cap is made up of dead cells and over time, these dead cells can be rubbed off you know, because of the friction as the root keeps digging itself into the ground. Some of these cells end up dying and basically they become the new dead cells. So this is constantly regenerating with dead cells. Um, because we find uh, roots in vascular plants, remember vascular plants are plants with vascular tissue. It's basically, it has these tubes called xylem and phloem. Remember, phloem, pH, the F sound, phloem moves food. So any food that's made in the top of the plant where the leaves are at, travels down and that way this part of the root could be fed with the food. Now, water is located here. This is where the plant absorbs water, by the roots. The water enters the roots, specifically it enters these root hairs. Now, these root hairs have two jobs. Just like I mentioned earlier, the root has two jobs. This is where um, the jobs are actually being made. Um, the absorption of nutrients from the ground and water is actually from the root hairs. and also the support. You might be thinking, how are these tiny, thin little hairs being able to hold a 20 ton tree like during a hurricane? Well, it's strength in numbers, okay? If you've ever tried, for example, um, breaking a pencil, just one pencil in your hand, it's easy, but try breaking 20 pencils at the same time. Or what about ripping a piece of paper? You could rip a piece of paper, but ever try ripping a phone book? You see, individually, one pencil is weak. One piece of paper is weak, but when you have a bundle of, of pencils, that's very difficult to break. When you have hundreds of pages together, it's difficult to rip at the same time. These root hairs may be small and they look individually insignificant and weak, but when you look at the thousands of roots that 
uh, tree would have, and each root can have tens of thousands of, of root hairs. This is strength in numbers. So these hairs actually are the ones that provide the anchoring. They're the ones that grab onto the particles of dirt and hold on and give it strength. If um, they've done computer modeling that what if um, roots didn't have root hairs, uh, the trees would be significantly weaker. Plants would be able to be pulled out of the ground a lot easier. So these root hairs, even though they're tiny and they're very thin, they are able to anchor the tree or the plant to the ground. And this is this is where the water and the nutrients come in. Not from here. The water actually gets absorbed by the root hairs. Next slide, stems. Okay, so the stem is where this will be the stem. And you will find branches. You're going to, and this is, you know, not, not necessarily a big branch. This is still part of the leaf. But whenever you look at a tree and, and you see the branches come out, that the branches are considered part of the stem. Uh, it would, uh, it includes the leaf structure and also flowers. Now, right here, if you look at this uh, stem right here, you see that little thing right here, it's called a bud. That is where the flower comes out. This was a plant that produces flowers. This will be a little bud. So if it was like a rose plant, this would be a rose bud. Now, this is very important. If your mom or dad um, have uh, well, rose bushes in their garden and you ever want to trim a flower, this is very important. Um, so I drew it right here on my whiteboard. So here is your stem and there's that little bud. That will potentially grow into a flower. Now, the mistake people do is that when they cut, when they're trimming rose bushes, they don't know where to cut. Uh, mistake number one is you never cut like this. Never cut it flat, okay? For some reason, plants are better off when you cut them, when you cut stems, when you come at an angle, okay? So cut it like that. Now, what you don't wanna do is make the cut too, uh, uh, too far from the bud or maybe like underneath it, you don't wanna cut it right here because this will be a flower. What you wanna do is, because this could grow up to be a flower, you wanna cut it at an angle like that. So this is where you cut, cut here, that cut. So not this one, let me erase it, not that one. Where I put the dashed line and not this one, definitely not that one right there. Uh, that dashed line just slightly above, maybe about a centimeter at most centimeter would be the width of your pinky nail and you cut it at an angle and um, because you are exp you're cutting the the rose bush and because um, bacteria or viruses can go in or you could get you know just like excess moisture and it could start rotting um, whenever you trim um, uh, these rose bushes you want to cover that it's kind of like if you cut your finger you want to cover it with the band-aid and if you know you, if you don't cover it it will make a scab and the scab is basically to protect you from infection that's why you shouldn't be picking out a scab because you're allowing viruses and bacteria to re-enter uh, this rose bush will make uh, uh, its own scab but it'll take time. In the meantime, you could get something like Elmer's glue. You know, the little, the white glue that, that you use to, um, you know, when you do arts and crafts. Um, Elmer's glue, it's non-toxic. Um, you just put a couple of drops of Elmer's glue right there and it'll start drying up and it'll form kind of like a natural band-aid for the, for the rose bush. So that's a little bit of a, a hint. Um, whenever you see a bud, just cut slightly above at an angle, okay? So those are different parts of the stem. Next slide. Okay, we are still under stems, but now we're going to talk about tree rings. Uh, many people know that you could determine the age of a tree by counting the rings, but many people don't know how to count the rings and they count them wrong. Well, before we get to the tree rings, let me show you how the wood is divided up, this stem. When we get to the, the, the big, the thick, the main part of the plant, the xylem and phloem is actually uh, separated, okay? So we have here, this is the living part of the plant, the cambium. This cambium right here is in the, notice it's like the, the middle layer. Here's the center of the tree, okay? And we have several layers and we have the cambium right here and the cambium goes around and we they just split it open so you can see it. This right here is where the xylem and phloem are made. So remember, phloem is, are the tubes that uh, move food and xylem moves water. So it's made. However, uh, when the this layer grows, the xylem and the phloem are separated. The phloem actually get pushed to the outer ring. Okay? And the 
xylem, the one that carries the water, gets pushed to the inner ring. So both of these are being made, xylem and phloem, but they're kind of being separated, almost like, you know, you're, they're saying, okay, um, if it was like boys on the left, girls on the right. We're basically saying uh, phloem on this side and xylem on this side. Now, I didn't say left or right because on this side right here, here's a cambium, the phloem would be going towards the outside. So now the phloem would be going to the right. So the phloem always goes into the, the outer part. And this is the reason why it's called inner bark. It's like, wait, is it inner more on the inside? No, because these two layers are the, the bark. Now there's inner bark and outer bark. Obviously the outer bark is on the outside and the, we also call it cork. This is pretty much dead phloem. Okay, the phloem has died. Right here, it's still alive. But as it gets older and it dies, it forms layers. Now, these layers will peel off um, over the years, some more than others. You've probably seen trees where the bark just is, falls off every year. So basically, the phloem, the one that moves food, is made here. And then it gets pushed to this layer. And here's where they're alive. And every year, they keep, they keep getting pushed over and over and over until they finally die off and they form this dead layer of cork. Now, what about the xylem, the xylem that carries the water? The, it's, the xylem is made over here and it gets pushed this side. And this is what we call sapwood. Now, trees that produce sap, I mean, uh, the maple tree is the most famous one, but many trees produce sap. This is where it's coming from. So if you're making, um, if you're trying to get natural maple syrup from a maple tree, you have to drill a hole and you have to reach this area, the sapwood, and this is where it comes out. Now, um, this is the living part right here, okay? Again, so here's where it's made, here's where it lives, and here, and when it gets pushed inner, it dies. Kind of like here, here's where the phloem is made, and it gets pushed out here. This is still a living phloem, and it gets pushed out further, and it, it dies. Well, now the opposite. The xylem is made here. It gets pushed towards the, inter, the inner layer, and here it lives and it, it moves water during its life. And over the years, it keeps getting pushed more and more until it, it gets over here. Now, technically, uh, it's not really dead because we learned earlier that um, xylem were already made up of dead cells. So it's not we it's not appropriate. Sorry, I called it um, living xylem. It, it's more like active xylem, you know, because the cells in xylem um, tubes are already dead and hollowed out. But active is that they're being used. They're being used to transport water here. They're shut down. They're retired. Now, what's the point of having them? Well, the main job is that this is what gives the, the tree its strength. All these layers of uh, xylem, of unused xylem, keep... Uh, Packing it in and packing it in. And obviously, as a tree grows bigger and bigger every year, it grows thicker and thicker and thicker. And as a result, um, we're adding more support. So we call this part where the water is moved sapwood, and this one's called heartwood. Now, the annual rings. Let me show you how to count the annual rings. Uh, the mistake people make is they start counting and they count every single ring up until they get to the end. And there's a mistake in that. And I'll tell you why there's an error. Um, one thing you don't do is you don't count from left and count all the rings to the right because now you're double dipping because every year you're making a ring. So if you're making a ring and you count this ring and that ring, you're counting the same ring that was made in a year. You have to start off on the center and you have to work your way out. The problem is you need to stop at a certain point. Counting every ring is wrong. I'll get to that in a moment. One thing I want to bring up about the rings is that the rings not only tell you how old the tree is, but the thickness of the rings will tell you the weather of that year. For example, let's say this tree is 50 years old because there's 50 rings. So if we're in the year 2020, we could actually go back in time and find out what the weather was like all the way to 1970. Now, I don't mean the weather like what was the weather on July 25th, 1971, and not like that. But I could tell you if that particular year rained a lot or it didn't. If the if there was a lot of rain that year, rain encourages growth. So trees will grow a lot more than usual. Therefore, their rings will be a lot thicker because since the tree grew, every year it adds a ring. And if it grew a lot, there'll be a bigger gap between rings. So if there's a ring with a wide gap, that tells you that it was a rainy season. Now, I won't tell you exactly how much it rained. We won't be able to tell that it rained like 21.2 inches that year, but we'll just know that it rained a lot that year. Now, what if the, there was a dry season? It didn't rain that much. Well, plants tend to stop growing on dry seasons. 
you know, they, they don't want to waste energy growing because of the fact that there's not enough water and you need water for photosynthesis. So if there are two rings that are very close together, like maybe like right here, if they're closer than usual, it means that maybe that year it was a particularly dry year. So if this tree is 50 years old and we start off, notice that we're starting off here. I'll tell you why we start off here in a moment. But that's 2020 and we go back 2019, 2018, 17, 16, 15. If we say, oh, this was 1982 and the, the rings between 1982 and 1981 are very close together, then we could tell that that year it was particularly dry, that that tree wasn't getting a lot of water. Okay, so let me show you how to count the rings. Uh, remember that there is a layer called the cambium where it's growing. It was this one right here. See how cambium is where new xylem and phloem are being made? There are actually no rings here. The rings are made right here. It, these are the xylem and here's the phloem. But the thing is, every year that we make xylem and phloem, we're making two rings. We're making a ring of xylem and a ring of phloem. So if we count these rings, we're double dipping. Okay, here's another problem. You might be thinking, well, why can't we just count all the rings and divide by two? Well, some of these rings get destroyed. They get lost. Remember, bark comes off. It's, it's where we get cork. Who's ever seen trees, you know, maybe in your backyard or in the park where the trees look like once a year they're shedding? Some trees will shed layers of bark and not to mention there could be damage. So we cannot count these rings because it's very unreliable. We don't know if we've lost layers over the years. So the best way to count rings is to start in the middle and work our way until we get to this huge gap of cambium and we stop right there. So let's say here's a tree trunk that I just cut. The way that we count is we start in the middle. Now we can move from here to the right or you can move from here to the left. I'm going to go to the right. Now, this first ring, that was year one, when it was a baby tree. That's, so it's one year old, that's two years old, three, four, five, six years old, and I'm gonna stop. This doesn't count. This huge gap is going to be the cambium right here, I'm trying to get, line this up, the cambium. And if you're thinking, well, what if it, was, it rained a lot? The ring cannot be that thick. I mean, when I, when I talked about the thickness of the rings, we're talking about like minute differences. You know, you would have to get a ruler to measure it. From this one, you can see a mile away. You'll, you'll know the cambium when you see it. The cambium is usually located near the edge because if you're like, how come there's not that much layers of, of right here of bark? It's been falling off. So this layer right here won't be that thick. So when you see it at an abnormally wide distance, that's where you stop. So we count it and it was six. Now it works either way. I could count towards the left. Okay, so start in the middle. That's one, two, three, four, five, six years old. What if I move up? That's year one, two, three, four, five, six years old. Or if I move down, same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't matter which way you count. The main thing is you start in the middle, you count the rings and you stop when you reach the cambium. And that will tell you how many years old that tree is. They found trees. Uh, in the redwood forest, I believe in Washington state that are over 300 years old That means that these trees were sprouting before we even had a country. It's kind of amazing uh, and Using that data scientists could get an idea of If that area was wet or dry that year by looking at the rings and there's other things you can even tell There was a if this tree survived a fire if there was a fire and this tree survived it, but maybe it got covered in smoke and soot. A lot of times the rings will come out slightly darker. So scientists could tell if there was a big fire in the area by even the color of the rings. It's amazing how much information you could get from the rings. Okay, last slide. Now, now we're getting to, we're at leaves. Um, leaves are vital because it's the leaves that capture the sun energy to make food. Specifically, um, the energy doesn't get turned into food. We use the energy to help us make the food. Think of it this way. Um, your oven doesn't make the cake, okay? The flour, the eggs, the butter, um, sugar, that cake batter becomes a cake. However, you need to put it in the oven because you needed to give it that energy to do that chemical reaction. Uh, what's happening in leaves is leaves turn water and carbon dioxide, the stuff we breathe out, and they turn that into uh, glucose, which... Um, I'm sorry, sucrose, brain fart right there. Um, 
or glucose. Now I'm kind of confused which one it is. I'll have to look it up later and, and I'll verify which one. But it's a sugar that plants make. So water carbon dioxide are made into the sugar and it's um, they use the energy from the sun to turn those chemicals into sugar. Now, they don't need sun all the time. That's one mistake people think. People think that plants get their energy from the sun. No, they don't because then when there's no sun, they would be dead. I mean, you need a constant supply of energy. Even when, when you're asleep, your body is still repairing and healing and growing. Same thing with plants. Uh, plants eat food like us. The only difference is they make the food and then they consume it. Then they, they, they break it down. We have to actually literally consume it and digest it and break it down. So that way when there's no sun or maybe it's cloudy for a couple of days, they have a, a food supply that they've made. Now the, the leaf is divided into several sections. Um, the very top section, it, the, the, this shiny waxy layer is called a cuticle. You might've noticed that leaves are very shiny on one side, but when you flip it over, they're very dull. Well, that shiny layer is comes from a wax. And it's the reason why, for example, uh, when you wash your car and then you, you wax and you buff the wax, cars come out very shiny. Uh, wax tiny, it tends to, to reflect light and give it the shine. Now this wax, its purpose is to basically prevent any water from escaping. These leaves are being exposed to sunlight consistently. And as a result, um, the water will evaporate. So yes, um, leaves will sweat out water and it will be a waste of, of water because of how big the tree is and, and the fact that water is a very scarce resource. So uh, they've developed this layer of wax, and we call that a cuticle, that it traps the water. Unfortunately, water can't you know, go in either, but that's, that's not a problem because the leaves' job is not to absorb water. That's why they developed roots. So the leaves gave up their ability to, to absorb water because they needed a way to prevent water from going the wrong way. Now, because this is the, the layer that is facing the sun, the sun is hitting always that top layer, not the bottom layer. The bottom layer that's dull is in the shade. The shiny layer is the layer that gets exposed to the sun. We need to put all of our chloroplasts. That was the organelle that, um, uh, that, that turns sunlight um, and water and, and carbon dioxide into that sugar. So uh, we're going to put cells with uh, tons of chloroplasts right here. Not every, well, if you did a cell model project and you got plant cells, um, you learned that one of the um, organelles was chloroplast, but not every plant cell has chloroplast. I mean, what's the giveaway? Chloroplast are green. So it's the green part of the plant. So if you're wondering, well, what about roots? Roots don't have chloroplast. Why would they make chloroplast? Roots are buried underground. Making chloroplast would be a waste of energy. So even though roots are plant cells, they actually don't have chloroplast. And we know that because it's they're not green. So these leaves are chock full of chloroplast and these are cells and they put all their chloroplast right here. The closer to the sun, the better. Now, once you turn that water and the carbon dioxide to sugar using sunlight, you make that food, you need to transport it. So what better way to transport it than with the xylem? Sorry, where is a phloem? <laughs> phloem, sorry, phloem moves food. Okay, so the food made is being transported in the phloem. But then why do we have a xylem? Well, leaves are living things, they're living cells, and all living cells need water. So we still need water to be given to the leaf. Okay, but um, once the food is made, obviously they can, th these cells can eat the food they made, but what about the stems and the roots and the branches? They need food. So any extra food gets transported in the phloem to various parts of the plant, or it, it can either be to feed them or for storage for later. Okay, now notice that the top cells right here, they're tightly packed together to get as much sunlight as possible. But when you get to the bottom half of the leaf, they're kind of like there's a lot of gaps. And the reason why there's a lot of gaps is because we need spaces for air to go in. Um, two things, plants breathe, but they don't breathe oxygen like us. They breathe um, in carbon dioxide. That's what, see carbon dioxide, that's what we breathe out. These little tiny openings are called stomata, and they're microscopic. If you look in the bottom of the leaf, you won't be able to see them that clearly. Um, there's ways that you could put a dye and you can see the stomata, but uh, you still probably need a, 
a microscope to get a better view. But there's tiny little pores, little openings, and they open up. And the leaf is able to breathe in carbon dioxide. And then when this chemical reaction photosynthesis is happening, it makes oxygen and they breathe out oxygen. So the oxygen that they make, that they breathe out, the oxygen that we humans have to breathe in, is actually coming out from here. Okay? So um, that's pretty much it it for this part i'm trying to think if i'm missing something um no i guess that's it okay so it was glucose i was having a brain fart uh, the water and carbon dioxide um uh, are turned into glucose using the energy of the sun so it was that i don't know if that was the first one i said i think it was the first one i should have went with my gut instinct so it was glucose there we go And that is the end of chapter 10, section 4. Um, I'm going to work on chapter 10, section 5 in a moment. And I'll upload that. And for now, we will be done with this packet. Okay? Stay safe. Stay indoors.